Hey, good morning, Sanctus Church. Welcome to the second last week out of the book of Esther, Glimpses of God. Now, if you've got a Bible, would love you to turn, again, physically or virtually, however you do it, to Esther chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. It's going to be on the screen for you today. A few weeks ago, my wife and I went to the dump. We continually are weeding that garden, doing all this stuff, and we actually had a lot more to get rid of, more brown bags. And so we stuffed our minivan full of this compost, basically, from the garden, and drove it. And it was a busy day. Lots of people were there. We got in the lineup. And I don't know if you've ever been to a dump, but what happens is you drive up and usually this piece of wood comes down to stop you going in and they weigh the car in front of you. And then you wait and then the stick comes back up, the barrier, and then you get weighed. So we're right up at the barrier. My wife and I are on our phones. They're weighing the person in front of us. We look up and the person signals us and we go right through the barrier. We literally snap it right in half. We're so like, oh, embarrassed. So we drive up and there's my wife and I, and we're so sorry. We just were looking at our phones and we thought the barrier was up, but it was down. And oh, I can't believe we did this. And we're thinking, did we damage? How bad did we damage the car? And the guy said, hey, no problem. Glad you're here at the dump today. What do you have in the back? And we're like, oh, we've got some compost. He said, great. You know where to go? I said, yeah. He said, okay, great. Thanks. Uh, have a great day. And we drove away. We're like, we just broke your barrier. Anyways, we got get out of the car and there's this lovely orange line on the front of our minivan. That's great. Get rid of all the brown bags and all the stuff. And then we're, again, embarrassed. We're going to see the person on the other side and we drive back. By the time we get back, they've already replaced the barrier. So we were like, oh, this has happened before. <laughs> and the person said, okay, thanks so much. Have a great day. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, that is an exceptional picture of God's grace. We go up and we break the barrier and we damage our, ourselves or others and we meet God. He's like, hey, how you doing? We're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I can't believe it. No problem. Uh, you got some stuff in the back you need to get rid of some garbage? No problem. You know where to go? No problem. And completely graceful, not giving us what we deserve. And by the time we get back to him, he's already repaired the barrier. That's the beauty of the Christian gospel. Undeserved grace, mercy, love. He forgives us. But... There is a limit to that. There's a time when that actually will stop being given. There's a time coming when actually the person says, you've broken the barrier, you're going to have to pay for it. And I want you to keep that at the forefront of your mind because by the end of this message today out of Esther, we're going to come back to when does that time run out? Okay, back to the story. The stage is set. If you were with us last week, you know this. Mordecai, publicly honored. Haman, no longer in control. The second banquet being held by Queen Esther is about to begin. This is the moment of moments. Esther 7-1. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half my kingdom it will be granted. So the question is asked again. It seems more impatience this time. What do you really want, my queen? And most likely at this moment, the king is a little drunk or tipsy. And it's like I can imagine Esther taking that deep breath, knowing that everything is hanging in the middle. All the fears, all the ambitions, all the hopes, all the dreams of the queen, of the Jews, of Haman, his family, her family, it's all in the middle. This is life and death, not just for one or two but for tens of thousands of people. And notice what the king says. What is your petition and what is your request? And Esther responds to both. Verse 3, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, ma majesty, if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. My petition, my hope, my deepest desire is don't let me die. <laughs> my request, my stand in the gap, my intercession is don't let all my family and friends and my ethnic group be slaughtered and murdered. Now remember, we've known this. The king is violent. The king is easily swayed. She shows great respect and deference for him, but also puts all her cards on the table. And she says in verse 4, for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male or female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. She's a master at doing this. See, en masse slavery was common and terrible, but it's not genocide. 
listen to one historian that helps us understand why she says this. Because for us in 2021, on mass slavery and genocide are basically the same. They're no-go's. She writes this, scholars estimate that half of the people living in urban centers in the ancient world were slaves. Debt could lead to slavery. We even see this in the Jewish story. Prisoners of war and rebellious groups were also enslaved. So too the Persian Empire enslaved and sometimes killed rebellious groups, such as the certain people that Haman claims don't obey the king's laws. Herodias, who lives at the time of this king, actually describes the Persian practice of enslaving insurrectionists that even Esther is alluding to in the second banquet. See, when Persians conquered a land, they gained mastery over the cities. Then they'd choose the most handsome boys and castrate them. Oh, And they would just become slaves to the king and not men. They'd take all the most beautiful women and give them to the king. They'd burn the cities and burn their temples. So Esther is basically saying, look, if myself or my people were going to be enslaved more than we already are as exiles, it would be terrible and uncomfortable and awful, but it would be normal for us. But this, my king, this, my love, this is so much worse. And again, she puts everything on the table. Annihilation, genocide, mass killing, mass looting. Well, the king is in shock. What are you talking about? How have I not heard about this? It's starting to dawn on him, I'm sure, that maybe he doesn't even know sort of the ancestry.com of his own wife. So it says in verse 5, King Xerxes says to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man who would dare do such a thing? Can you imagine the moment? Haman realizes, of course, it's him, because he didn't know that the queen was Jewish, because she had hidden the fact from everyone. So now the queen has her opening. And the king could have not imagined that out of his massive empire that stretches from what we'd call India and modern Pakistan all the way over to Sudan, that the one who'd worked all this out was his bestie, his friend, his drinking partner, his prime minister right beside him. Who is he? The king says. And Esther is about to say, well, it's hateful. It's hostile. It's Haman. She says in verse 6, an adversary. An enemy, this vile Haman. Well, Haman was terrified before the king and queen, and the king got up in a rage and and left his wine and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Now, why did the king rush out into the garden? I mean, we've all seen his ability to kill quickly, to banish quickly, quickly, uh, to, to use his power. Why not just order Haman's death in the moment? Well... Because I think as I read the text again and again, he knows that he has to save face because he's responsible for this. He had let someone else play him, one of his best friends, and and the king knows the law cannot be changed. So now the king is in the garden trying to work this out because he has to kill his friend, but he also realizes his wife has to die because she's now under a a law that he affirmed that cannot be changed. So how do I kill my second in command? How do I get out of this massive mess? How did I allow this to happen? Now at this moment, as he's outside pondering, Haman is begging the queen for his life and his family's life and his position and his possessions. And he must have been holding onto her royal robes or clinging to her in some form. And as we will see, the queen's on a couch and Haman is now actually on the couch with her, grasping for his life. Now, by the way, just a side note that's important. Remember, we learned in week one, there's great humor and irony throughout Esther. Only a woman can save Haman. How far we've come from chapter one, where we were told that women all needed to be put in their place. And yet, to touch the queen, let alone to be on the same couch, is way out of bounds, way over the line. Now, in Jewish literature, not in the scriptures itself, rabbis used to teach that God sent Gabriel right into this moment. And as he's begging for his life, Gabriel went behind him and shoved him. So he lands on the queen right when the king comes back in to seal his fate. Verse eight, just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining and the king exclaims, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? 
Now, this is like extremely strong language. The king is tipsy or drunk for sure, and he knows this man has betrayed his queen. Now it looks like he's trying to sexually assault her. Now, either this is an excuse to move away blame from his own complicity and or it's a mix of both. But whatever it is, the end of Haman has come. As soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's faith. And then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king said, well, just so you know, wink, wink, wink. There's a pole reaching up to 75 feet high and it stands by Haman's house. And he had it set up for Mordecai who spoke, uh, who, who spoke up t- to help you, O king. I- I've never seen this, but the eunuch that just happened to point out where their pole was and how it was for Mordecai and now it wasn't. And just, you know, I'd like to point this out because, you know, I'd really like to be in the king's favor. He's one of the ones who tried bringing Vashti in the first place and she would not come in chapter one. Again, this shows how politics always works, right? It's not about loyalty. It's where the shifting sands of power are found and he's trying to get ahead himself in this really dangerous, awful moment. Well, it says in verse nine, the king said, impale Haman on it. Oh, have you thought about impaling lately? It's worse than hanging. So they impaled Haman on the pole they had set up for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. Oh, but the story's not uh, done. Just go over to chapter eight, verse one. Well, that same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king and Esther told the king how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over Haman's estate. So just like that, think about this. Mordecai gets Haman's job. Esther now gets all of Haman's property. And so all the power that Haman had is now given to his enemies. But there's still a massive problem. Haman's gone, but his law is still intact. Haman's gone, but his law is not. The genocide is still on. And the greatest problem is even if the king wanted to change things, he can't because actually once a law is a law, it's a law. And the king is under the law. So it says in verse three that Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Now, everyone stop. This really matters. Haman is called an Agagite one last time. Now, if you don't choose to remember this, then God and Esther feel really cruel and wicked by the end of the story. Now, we talked about this. Let me do this again. Please bear with me. It matters. Haman is a direct ancestor of a tribe called the Amalekites. And let me just do this quick summary again. When God's people were on their way to the promised land, they were, un, they were attacked for no reason. It just happened. The attack was violent. The attack was unprovoked. The attack was without mercy. And the attack was life-threatening. Many years after this moment, as the Jews reflected on this vicious attack, it's sort of summarized in Deuteronomy 25, 17 like this. Remember what the Amalekites did to you as the Jews along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. Okay, this was an opening on an ongoing way, in a new way, and the goal was to destroy the Jewish people. But why did the Amalekites attack the Jews? Well, because the gods, the Amalekites, which are real powers of darkness, want to stop God and his work through the Jewish people that leads to the redemption of the world. What is happening on the ground physically, which appears opportunistic or tribal alone, is actually a conflict between the gods of the Amalekites and God himself. And remember, we talked about this. When the first king shows up in Israel, Saul, what does God say about the Amalekites? 1 Samuel 15, 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they layweighed them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroys all that belongs to them and do not spare them. Wipe them out. And what did we learn? Saul didn't obey God. And so God says to Samuel in verse 10, I regret I made Saul king 
because he has turned away from me and not carried out my instructions. So again, with all that background in spiritual conflict and tribal warfare and disobedience, we come to Haman and we find out his ancestry is Amalekite. Here's the point. Haman shouldn't have existed. <laughs> now, why am I saying all this again? Because as we end this sermon today, it's going to deal with so much that could cause you as a Christian or a seeker to misunderstand God or wonder if you should leave the Christian faith if God is like this. So just hold on to that and we're going to come back. Okay, so what does the king do? Well, he turns to Mordecai and says in verse 8, write another law in the king's name on behalf of the Jews as seems best to you. And you seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. So Mordecai <laughs> now takes Haman's role, writes on the king's behalf like Haman had, takes the king's ring and makes a new law. Now ready? Now there are two laws, both in contradiction to each other, that are going to be enacted on the same day. And verse 11 tells us what the second law is. The king's edict granted that Jews in every city had the right to assemble and protect themselves. And then basically, if they were attacked, they could destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them, and also their women, their children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. Now it says in verse 16, now the Jews, for the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy and gladness and honor. Verse 17, in every province, in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was great joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebration. The personal vindication that Esther and Mordecai had experienced is now experienced by every single Jew across the whole Persian empire. Fasting, mourning, fear, death, is now feasts of joy and hope and a bright future. See, God had moved in the most spectacular of ways, profoundly refreshing. The no had become the yes. Think about it. Haman's law is there, yes. It was written down, yes. It was unstoppable, it seemed, yes. But God showed up. And God's not afraid of any person or anything. What doors he cannot, what doors he closed, they never can be opened. What doors he opened, they can never be closed. And so God places Esther and Mordecai right in the position to not only restore them, but also set up a new law. And then there's this wild little verse at the end, verse 18. And many people from many other nationalities became Jews because of the fear of the Jews had seized them. Now, lots of people go, oh, this isn't fake. This is fake. This isn't real. Basically, lots of people said, well, Mordecai's the prime minister. The queen is Jewish. They've got the king's backing. And so, you know, let's just go with the flow. Let's become Jewish by custom. We probably won't really believe. But let's just do this because it's the easy, safer way out. It's conversion by, I don't know, just by safety, not by conviction. Yet other people go, actually, hold on a second. Maybe this was real. Maybe this was an en masse moment. Maybe this is sort of the precursor to what we see in the Christian gospel. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, meaning the true living God. It was Ray Steadman that years ago said, when, because of your faith, your life becomes perceptibly different, when your reactions are quite the opposite to what the situation seems to call for, and your activities can no longer be explained in terms of your personality, that is when your neighbor will sit up and take notice. See, in the eyes of the world, it is not our relationship with Jesus that counts. It's our, it's our resemblance to Jesus. In the midst of circumstances that look like certain defeat, there is no more powerful testimony than joy produced by faith. Okay, we're going to stop there and begin to unpack this. Let me start by saying what an amazing, encouraging gift this, pass this passage is for us today. But then we need to ask, well, what do we do with this? Why did God give us again this passage in this moment on this Sunday in this period? Well, let's deal with that big elephant in the room. <laughs> let's deal with the biggest problem 
that could be a stumbling block to seekers and a seed of doubt that could cause damage for believers. Back to the Jews and back to the Amalekites. See, as you're reading the story of Esther, especially chapter 7 and 8, you should be cheering, yes, social justice, yes, injustice is replaced by justice, but you should also be cringing as a Christian because there's no mercy here. There's no mercy. I mean, she didn't show any mercy to Haman. You might say, well, he didn't deserve it. But if you read in chapter 9, Esther asks for all 10 of his sons also to be impaled. So what is righteous, God-fearing Esther doing here? I mean, where's the grace? In other words, where's Jesus in all of this? This just feels like revenge. You're going to kill my people, I'm going to kill your people. Now, okay, lean in. This matters. Don't forget that Esther is finally finishing what her ancestor Saul was not willing to do, obeying God. The Amalekites had sinned and were unrepentant, and God brought judgment on them. There's a human battle, but then there's a spiritual battle battle taking place. See, in theology, this is called holy war, and you might be like, I'm so uncomfortable with that. Hold on. How do we deal with this? See, we all know if you are a Christian, some of you aren't, but for we who are Christians, we know that Jesus taught us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and attack us and turn the other cheek. We don't find it here in Esther, it sure seems. And to make things more complicated, don't forget Jesus is the God of the Old Testament who actually told Saul to wipe out the Amalekites. You can't separate Jesus from the God of the Old Testament. He is God. So... What do we do with this? Where where does this leave all of us? Well, first of all, let's understand what holy war is and it's not in the Bible. One person said, there's just five ways to think about it. And I'll say it slow, write this out because actually a lot of people struggle with this. There's five phases, he writes. The first phase in the Bible is God fights for Israel. God is holy warrior for Israel. The Amalekites attack Israel, God fights for them. The second phase is God fights Israel when they rebel. The third phase in the Old Testament is God gives hope about future redemption. Something's going to change, he says. Four, the great turning point. Jesus Christ is the divine warrior who ends holy war on earth. Okay. And then lastly, the coming day of Jesus when he returns a second time, he as divine warrior will destroy all evildoers. So as Christians, we are not called into holy war anymore. Our holy war is not against flesh and blood, as Ephesians 6 says. But this does bring up something that every single person within the sound of my voice, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, a seeker or skeptic, you have to wrestle with and grapple with. And here it is. There is a time coming when grace runs out and there will be no more mercy. And if you beg for your life like Haman did with Esther, the answer still will be no. There's a time when you're going to arrive at the garbage dump and drive, right, through the barrier, and the person's going to say, no, we're not repairing that. You're now going to pay for that. I love when uh, one person, Karen Jobs, wrote this. For Haman, things are not actually what they appear to be. Even while he himself was doing them, suddenly, without warning, the true destiny of human evil is revealed. Destruction by the long promised justice of God. On the final day of judgment, when truth is revealed, the condemned will finally realize they have no one to blame but themselves. Fallen human nature, all of us, set ourselves against God in the Garden of Eden and we were condemned to to death by God. Fallen human nature is embodied in the book of Esther as the agite nature of Haman. But it's the universal condition of all humans that have not been reconciled to God through Christ. Now listen, lean into this one. Haman the powerful, and Haman the wealthy, and Haman the prideful, here's the phrase, set out to live in a way that seemed right to him. Where have I heard that before? Oh, everywhere in our culture. He set out a way to live which seemed right to him. But in the end finds out only too late that he actually set himself up against God and his people. So it will be with those who are not in Christ on their own day of judgment. 
See, here's what we need to wrestle down. Sin is that serious. <laughs> and every single human being is Haman. We might not be organizing genocides, but we all, all deeply religious people and deeply secular people and everything in between, spiritual people, when you say, I will live my life determined by what I think is right or my family think is right, and God's not in the picture, we're Haman. Romans 3.23, just let God's word wash over you. Just let it, just hear it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one person, one man, Adam, and death through sin, in this way death came to all people because all have sinned. We're all Haman. We're, we, we have all chosen this path. But then there's this gap, this moment of mercy found fully in Jesus. That's why, again, Jesus' best friend wrote this in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in Jesus will not, here it is, die, but actually have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, will not die. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. When you go to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, which, by the way, we're going to hang out a lot in next year, listen to what it says in Revelation 21.8. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's the second death. And in Revelation 20, when there's this beautiful description of the new heavens and the new earth and everything being restored, everything being brought right, it reads like this in Revelation 23. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things has passed away. Amen, amen, amen. And then it says amazingly even more, verse 26, and the glory and honor of all the nations, all the ethnic groups will be brought into it. But then it says in verse 27, verse 27, but nothing impure will enter into that. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, <laughs> This part of the story of Esther reminds us that there is coming a time where if we don't actually reconcile with God now through Jesus, it will be too late. So while there is time, while there is mercy, while there is a moment to actually have the better king make us right, repent, turn from sin, trust in Jesus, be given eternal life, forgiveness and hope. God can make every one of us new. I love this. God takes all of us like Haman and makes us Mordecai. God turns us and lifts us and gives us something better than prime minister roles or signet rings. He calls us children. He calls us friends. He gives us eternal life. He forgives our misdeeds. There is time. We're living actually in the time of grace now. Like there's literal grace now. There is real space now for salvation and mercy. If you turn now and beg for your life, knowing that you've actually crossed all sorts of lines, God will actually forgive. Do not turn away from my words. Forget my words. Don't turn away from God's word today. Don't harden your heart. Listen, I hear this all the time in our culture. So let me do the opposite. Do not live your best life according to you. Don't do it. Self-expression and personal defined authenticity and self-love as our culture is now declaring it is not truth. That is our view of ourself, living our life the way we think we should. No, no, it's God's view that counts. So turn to God through Jesus and be lifted up before it's too late. This is the moment of mercy, but it's also the warning about judgment. All of us have sinned. 
All of us have declared war. All of us have broken the barrier. All of us deserve no mercy. God, because he's so profoundly loving, gives mercy. But the, the moment of mercy is for a time. And just like Haman, if you realize this too late, you will come back for mercy and it will no longer be there. Repent, find life. Talk to any Christian in your life. None of us will tell you we're going to heaven because we're better, more moral, more religious. We're all hypocrites and struggling, but the difference is we said we're Haman and we need forgiveness. And God lifted us up and robed us and ringed us and made us different. That's the amazing thing about Christianity. Some of you, probably many of you, are followers of Jesus and you've had that turning moment. Here's what I just want to say to you. I want to encourage you. I want to give you hope. I, I, want, to, I want to remind you. God can reverse anything. And even now, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, would you go across our church and beyond our church and bring this up to people's mind? What is the biggest thing you're facing right now? For real. Maybe it's like you lost your job because of COVID, or maybe someone's sick in your family, or actually maybe you got a child or a spouse that has not met Jesus or is running from Jesus, or maybe it's a, it's a medical condition. Or uh, There's a thousand positive... Think about the biggest thing you're facing, stress, life. And just, I want to remind you, if God could take Mordecai and Esther, who are about to be massacred and already themselves were exiles and slaves, and raise them up to be prime minister and queen. By the way, I'm not preaching that you're going to be queen or, or, or prime minister. <laughs> Probably don't want either of those jobs. I think the point is this. If God can reverse their, situa their situation, he can reverse yours. And instead of just looking at the massive mountain that's in front of you, go speak to the God who actually knows everything about the mountains and have him deal with it. Ask God to begin to reverse the unreversible. Because when he does, you'll give him glory and you'll give testimony to others. Talk to God this week about that massive thing. If God can do it here, God has not changed. He can do it with you. Oh, and here's the last place. I just want to end, just so we're all on the same page. In the end, everyone, evil loses. In the end, evil loses. Not just the judgment of humans. If you read Revelation 20, it's clear. Satan, all the darkness, death, worldliness, it's gone. So just remember, as you're hearing the story of Esther, you say out loud this week, you remind yourself again, when you see injustice in the world, when you see evil in the world, when you can't, just remember, that doesn't have the final say. Just like Haman suddenly was overcome, so when Jesus returns, it's all going to be overcome and actually we'll see new life. So for some of you, repent and turn to the love of God while there's still mercy. For others, bring your biggest problem to God and ask him to reverse it. And for all of us, do not forget that evil will lose in the end. And that's not wishful thinking. That is hope. Because hope is grounded in historical truth that's been worked out and is affirmed and will come true. So God, thank you, God of Esther, God of Mordecai, that you are sovereign, like we learned last week, that you're providential, like we learned last week, that you're good. So for some who are listening, Holy Spirit, just speak to them, show them their sin, so they will actually come to a place of mercy and repentance and life. I just pray for that. And then for others, they're going to bring big things to you. Lord, would you lift them up in ways that are impossible? And for all of us, remind us that death loses in the end and evil loses in the end. And just like Haman was brought down, so all evil will be brought down. Uh, we just pray this in the name of Jesus. We all said together, amen. Amen. 